Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. I wanted to ask you, because I know what our subject matter is today, have you ever heard of the stand-up comedian Brian Regan? No. Brian Regan, he's fantastic. We actually went to see him at, is it the Dolby now? Yeah, I okay. think it's we the Went Dolby, to see him yeah. at the Dolby. And he has a great bit. It's not even a bit. He was on Comedians in Cars with oh, Jerry Seinfeld. Seinfeld, right. And they're driving along, and he's talking about how he got into stand-up. And he says there are eight kids in his family, adults now, eight kids, four occupations. And Jerry kind of looks at him, two comedians, two firefighters, two teachers, <laughs> and two salespeople. <laughs> and he said, every person found a sibling and said, I'm going to go with you. <laughs> Which is, it so reminds me of this episode because we're going to be talking about... Sibling rivalries. Sibling and rivalries. Not, and not always rivalries. Sometimes they actually got along. Yeah. Sometimes supportive. Right. The most famous, <laughs> as we just dive right into this, and we're not going to talk about them a lot. No. But the most famous is Joan Fontaine and Olivia de Havilland. Yes. The feuding sisters. So famous. I looked up just briefly, and we all kind of know this story, but there were two things that struck me. One was this quote from Olivia saying, our biggest problem, meaning Joan and Olivia's biggest problem was that we had to share a room. <laughs> it and started early. <laughs> it started early. And that Joan Fontaine, now this is Life Magazine. I don't know if it's true, but I would think Life Magazine would have, you know, looked at their sources and figured it out that Joan claimed to have planned to kill <laughs> Olivia at age nine. She was nine years old and she was planning a murder. I read that. I, I, I Do have you think that that is true? I don't know, but from everything I've ever heard about Joan Fontaine, I wouldn't put it past her. Okay. Just a little interesting tidbit about Joan Fontaine. We always talk about my fairy godmother, Anne Rutherford. Yes. Anne Rutherford married Bill Dozier, the great producer who produced the TV series Batman. Bill's first wife was Joan Fontaine. Oh. So Anne has told me lots and lots and lots of stories about oh, Joan Fontaine. Let us let us hear. Do you have any dirt you can share? Well, one thing I will say is Bill and Joan had a daughter named Debbie, and Joan was so jealous of Debbie that she made her wear her hair cropped off really short and really just tried to make her look frumpy so she didn't outshine Joan. <laughs> This is her own <laughs> her own daughter, yes. daughter. And later, Debbie eventually had enough of Joan, apparently, and she ran away to Bill and Ann's house, and Bill and Ann basically raised her. So, oh. yeah. So I don't know that Joan was going to win the Mother of the Year award right. anytime. Would you put? So maybe you'd put it on Joan as opposed to Olivia, or do you think? Well, they were I'm equally? sure it takes two to tango. But. Probably. Yeah. It sounded like they they had a good time fighting yes. when they were kids. But you know, sibling relationships are complicated. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. I think the first one that that we should talk. about about is actually the antithesis of that. And I did not know that these two gentlemen were brothers because as we'll talk about, there is quite an age difference. Yes, yes. I love that you didn't know that. See, that's what I'm hoping this podcast will sort of bring to light siblings that no one knew about, yes, which is fun. Yes. So Dana Andrews. My it, favorite. Yes. I love him so much. I love him so much. He is the brother to Steve Forrest. I know. Can you believe that? It's amazing. Classic film actor Dana Andrews and SWAT man Steve Forrest yes, brothers. <laughs> yes, and and you know many other television shows as well. But Dana Andrews, really quite the movie star. Oh, major movie star. Personally, one of my favorite actors of all time. I think he was so great and natural, and both were, were good actors, but just in different ways. They started off, they were both Southern boys. They were born to uh, in a family where the father was a preacher. He traveled a lot. I think Dana was born in Mississippi and Steve was born in Huntsville, Texas. Dana went to Hollywood first. He wanted to be a singer. While he was starting out, he met the love of his life. He got married. 
He had a baby. He went first. But then a little tragedy hit Dana when he first hit Hollywood. He and his wife were going to have a second baby, and she died in childbirth, and the second baby died. So it just devastated Dana, and it made him throw himself into his work. So I think just that's, to forget. And just, to and I think that's where he it. got his work ethic, why he was so prolific and such a professional actor. And he dove into his work at the Pasadena Playhouse, which is, as we know, still here. And actually, that's where he got discovered. He was doing a play at the Pasadena Playhouse, and Samuel Goldwyn spotted him in this play, really saw potential, put him under contract. Things were looking up for him about that time. He also met his second wife. This was all in 1939, I believe, and, you know, remarried. So his personal life was coming back together. But Goldwyn didn't know what to do with him. Really? For some reason, he he just didn't quite know where to place him, what to put him in. So he if he was a heavy or if he was a leading man leading or... Man. Exactly. So he didn't really do anything with him, but he did sell his contract to 20th Century Fox, which was the best thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> oh, good. Because they knew what to do with him. And in fact, they saw so much potential in him as a leading man that for his film debut, he was in a lead role. His film debut was a fun movie called Lucky Cisco Kid which was a series that Cesar Romero did. And this particular one had my favorite Mary Beth Hughes in it. And Dana was the second lead. So quite an auspicious beginning. Well, and having had, I think he was in over 20 productions at the Pasadena Playhouse, to have that background, you really can walk onto a set and feel feel comfortable. Yeah, You know, knowing that you know... He knew... He wasn't just coming out here with no experience at all. Yeah, he definitely knew what he was doing. By contrast, baby brother Steve, who was 16 years younger, he did a a completely different route. He went to the Army first uh, once he turned 18. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge, which I think is interesting. And then after the war, he followed Dana to Hollywood to be a star. But not at first. He went to UCLA. He got a degree in theater and a minor in psychology. Hmm. Um, But, you know, by this time, Dana was a huge movie star. He'd appeared in Tobacco Road and the Oxbow Incident and Laura, the classic film noir Laura. and State Fair with Gene Crane, Fallen Angel. And the best of all, he'd appeared in The Best Years of Our Lives, one of the greatest movies ever made. It, <laughs> Let's it, face it. It absolutely is. Yeah. So Steve comes along and he needs some help. And his brother was happy to help him. So Dana gave Steve a part in a movie. So Steve Forrest's first job was due to his brother. So there was not much rivalry there. They, They were very close and very supportive of each other. And with that age difference, I suppose that in some ways, he might have been a father figure to him, that Dana might have been. I think so, because I'm not sure about the relationship with her dad, but absolutely, it it would make sense. That one movie that he did, uh, I believe it was called Sealed Cargo in 1951, not not a great movie, but it gave him his first speaking line on film, but it also allowed him to make enough money that he could marry his sweetheart, who he'd met in college. Her name was Christine, and they ended up getting married then, and ended up up staying together until Steve Forrest passed away, which is lovely. Both Dana and Steve, I know Dana's first wife passed away, but his second wife, he also yes. stayed married, which if y'all have been listening to these podcasts, <laughs> you know that that is a very rare thing in Hollywood, right? Those, those brothers were faithful. <laughs> yes, they were faithful. <laughs> exactly. But the fun thing about Steve Forrest is after this little bit in Dana's movie, he went on to work the La Jolla Playhouse, hmm. where he caught the eye of the great Gregory Peck, who we talk about a lot on this podcast yes. because we love him so much. Love- and Peck saw potential in Steve Forrest and helped him get a contract at MGM. So now Steve's career has taken off. In very much a similar way. Yes. From a theater to somebody spotting him and then, you know, moving on so to So kids, things. keep doing those plays. <laughs> yes, please keep doing those plays. Forrest started appearing in supporting roles. He was in It Happened to Jane with Doris Day and Jack Lemmon and Heller in Pink Tights with Sophia Loren. I mean, he did some really fun supporting roles as he started building up his resume. By the 70s, Forrest transitioned to television. That's what a lot of people know him from. He did guest stars on Mission Impossible, Streets of San Francisco, The Twilight Zone, The Six Million Dollar Man, Dallas, L.A. Law. Then, of course, he did SWAT, the show that most people know him from, at least my generation. Yes, seeing the photos of him in his police uniform is very, very familiar. And 
Interestingly enough, Steve Forrest also appeared in the movie Mommy Dearest in 1981, where he played a character named Greg Savit, which is basically based on the celebrity attorney Greg Baltzer, oh. who, if you recall from an earlier podcast, is the man that broke Lana Turner's heart yes. that caused her to run off and elope with Artie Shaw. So it's all connected. Right. And we may be talking about him in more detail later. In, not this podcast, but absolutely. In a, in we have a, a whole episode. podcast on him. Yeah. But the beauty, I think, of those brothers is they were super close, super supportive. Later in his life, Dana Andrews had some personal troubles. He had battles with alcoholism, but he got himself clean and sober, became a big supporter of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Steve Forrest was there to support him all the way. Just loving brothers, no real controversy, but two really good actors, and I, I love hearing how close they were. I do too. That gives me hope. The next siblings that we're going to talk about, Jeanette McDonald, who I think most people will recognize that name. That operatic singing star yes. with all those Nelson Eddy movies. Nelson Eddy. You know, we all kind of make fun of her voice. <laughs> but her sister is an actress by the name of Marie Blake, a.k.a. Blossom <laughs> Rock, who I know from... The Adams Family. Yes, she was Grandmama from The Adams Family. <laughs> and what a gorgeous face and so perfect for, for that. Absolutely. Aren't they the most completely opposite sisters oh, you can think of? Completely yeah. opposite. I never would have recognized that. Now, how were they in terms of supporting each other and who started first? Did Jeanette you know, start first? They, they were actually very supportive also, but it was Marie who got her start first. She was the first one to head off to New York. She first did vaudeville. She did theater and she also did radio. One of the things she did was she worked in a nightclub too early on and it's funny because in a radio interview one time she said that she had to quit the nightclub show because all the dancers talked too dirty for her <laughs> oh so, so maybe marie or grandma you know adams was maybe a prude <laughs> well, you i would look at her and think she was you know real salty herself but exactly but clearly not but it's funny because Marie Blake actually helped Jeanette McDonald get her start. Marie landed herself in a show and they needed more singers and dancers. So Marie suggested her sister, who at the time was still living in Philadelphia. So they brought up Jeanette McDonald. She tried out for the director. He loved her, gave her a part in the show, which basically launched Jeanette McDonald's career. So again, really supportive sisters here. Marie and Jeanette also formed a sister act, which was went on for a while. But then Marie met her husband, who was singing singer-dancer Clarence Rock. Basically, the sister act broke up and Marie started a husband-wife act with Clarence, Clarence. Rock. And so, is that where the blossom comes from? She decided to use a different name? With... I, I think it's where the rock definitely comes from, but right. I don't know if blossom was a nickname, a Maybe. pet name, but, um, but I love that. Blossom Rock. Yeah. Meanwhile... They have their act, their husband and wife act, and McDonald has perfected her soprano voice, and she starts auditioning, and she gets in a Broadway show, Irene, with Irene Dunn. I know. How about that? Not not a bad place to start. Not a bad place at all. But it's interesting because Jeanette being an Irene really changed the trajectory of her career. It, it really, uh, you know, the, the play was a hit, and it really got her a lot of notice. So that led to, I think, when you score such a success on Broadway, Holly Hollywood comes knocking. It just seems the way it goes. And that's what happened with Jeanette. She soon found herself in Hollywood doing a movie. And did they even know that she could sing at this point? You know, they did. I think that was part of the appeal. They were looking for a singing sensation who could appear in all of these musicals, which she certainly fit the bill and certainly had the, the goods to back it up. So she comes to Hollywood. She starts appearing in movies. She starts doing the Nelson Eddy movies that were so popular. People forget it wasn't just her voice. She was a brilliant actress in San Francisco in 1936 with Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy, Broadway Serenade with Lou Ayers, Smiling Through with Brian Ahern. So many great movies that weren't necessarily Nelson Eddy movies that she appeared in. So going back to Blossom, her <laughs> sister, it really wasn't until 1937 that she actually made her mark in Hollywood. Yes, yeah, she sort of stayed in New York and stuck with the vaudeville act with her husband. But then in 1937, I think, she comes to uh, Los Angeles. She gets a contract with MGM. Never look back because she started working immediately. She had that great character face. And she was cast in the Dr. Kildare films, which were the very, very popular films about the young doctor, and she played the switchboard operator in all the movies. She also appeared in the Andy Hardy series with Mickey Rooney and Louis Stone. She started just showing up in, in good stuff. She was in The Women with everybody. I Married a Witch with Veronica Lake and Frederick March. She really was just this prolific 
wonderful character actress. And the whole time, you know, Jeanette by now is a superstar, but so supportive of her career. As Marie continued to grow her career, Mm -hmm. Jeanette cooled her jets a little bit. She really, I don't know if she just got more interested in family life. because she got married, right? Yeah, she married actor Gene Raymond. They were very happy. And I think that that's what changed her priorities. So as Jeanette started winding down, Blake's taking off. By the 60s, Jeanette's had some troubles with illnesses and things like that. Whereas Marie ends up on the Adams family and becomes, you know, a household name. Sure. But Jean- they say that Jeanette never missed an episode. She was so proud of her sister for being on the show and so supportive. I love hearing that. Which is lovely. Yes. We just had two sisters. Now we have two brothers. <laughs> oh, the, the urbane Brits, as oh, I call goodness. them. Oh, my goodness. Now, this was another one. George Sanders, much more familiar to me than Tom Conway. But these two brothers, also very successful. I would say George Sanders, oh, definitely more, more successful. successful. Yes. And also struggled along the way. Struggled. Yeah, they did. It's funny because I didn't know they were brothers until maybe four or five years ago. And I was watching a movie, uh, actually a movie with Ann Rutherford called okay. Two O'Clock Courage. And, and I wasn't watching it. I was listening to it from another room. And I thought, that's George Sanders. And I went in. It wasn't George Sanders, but they have the exact same voice. If you've ever noticed, they just have that perfect baritone, yes. urbane British voice. And it's identical. It's hard to tell them apart just from their voices. And they came to an agreement that one of them had to change their name, <laughs> right? Which is fun because Sanders hit first. He really made a name for himself first. And then Tom Conway did. But he didn't want to capitalize on the same name. So they basically flipped a coin and whoever won got to keep the family name, which was Sanders. So George won. And so Tom became Tom Conway Conway. as opposed to Tom Sanders. We're going to get into more detail about the Sanders Conway brothers. But first, it's time for this week's Hollywood pop quiz. Steve. All right. So we're talking about siblings and we're talking about George Sanders. Great actor. The question of the day is, which two famous sisters did George Sanders marry? He married sisters, folks. Okay, that's just a little (laughs) weird. Only in Hollywood. (laughs) All right, we'll be right back with more of the sibling rivalries and the answer to our pop quiz after this. Steve and Dan will be right back. But first, another stop on the Hollywood tour. Contrary to popular belief, the round Capitol Records building in Hollywood was not intentionally designed to look like a stack of records. In fact, Lou Nadorf, the architect, was kept in the dark as to the building's owner until his design had been submitted. Nadorf was only 24 years old, and it was the first project that he started from scratch. The Capitol Records building was built in 1956. The iconic structure has 13 stories and features a blinking light on the roof that spells out Hollywood in Morse code. And now, back to Steve and Ann from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. So we're back talking about George Sanders and Tom Conway, brothers, Greer Garson. It's funny how these people pop up in each other's lives before they're famous. She had a part in encouraging George Sanders. (laughs) She did. Before Sanders became an actor, he worked for an advertising agency. And one of the young women who also worked there was a struggling actress. And she encouraged him to try theater. And it was Greer Garson. And he ended ended up doing a Noel Coward play, which wasn't necessarily a huge success, but it was enough to launch him in his film career in London. Absolutely. It got him noticed by 20th Century Fox, which got him cast in the Tyrone Power movie, Lloyds of London. Mm. That was a huge hit. It got him to Hollywood, and it really started his career. That's when he started making great movies, started building a name for himself in Hollywood. And soon after, Brother Tom, he comes right behind him. Right. In 1940, Sanders' career was taking off with The House of the Seven Gables, Rebecca. Oh, my yes, goodness. Rebecca. Foreign correspondent. I mean, you know, what a great timing for Tom Conway to kind of pop in and say, hey, bro, ride can those, you help me ride out? Ride those coattails. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Conway, he got a contract at MGM. He appeared in some minor movies. He didn't have as great of a beginning as George Sanders did, but he worked. He worked a lot. He was in one of the Tarzan movies, Tarzan's Secret Treasure in 1941, which is kind of fun. And he has a small part in Waterloo Bridge with Vivian Lee. So, you know, he 
was getting out there, getting some work. But then what really happened was Sanders started a whole film series called The Falcon. It became a very popular series of detective films. Right. He did many of them. They were very popular, but he got tired of them. So because Tom Conway and George Sanders were so similar in stature and appearance and voices, for sure. Yes. They had this clever idea that they would kill off George Sanders' character from The Falcon and they would bring in his brother and that would carry on the series. And that's what they did. That's what they introduced Tom Conway as the Falcon's brother. They killed off George and carried on with Tom. And so now Tom has a long-term contract with RKO and his brother George is able to move on to more interesting roles. And boy, the roles he moved on to. Mm. He is in The Lodger with Meryl Oberon and and Hanover Square with uh, Linda Darnell, The Picture of Dorian Gray, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, uh, Mm. so many great movies. Samson and Delilah, you know, Hedy Lamarr and Victor Mature. So he really was at the pinnacle of his power and his fame and his popularity at this point. And maybe the most famous movie that I think of him being in, at least that character that he plays is so iconic, is in 1950s All About Eve. Yes, without a doubt. But Conway, he was no slouch. He made some kind of some really fun B-movies that are now kind of cult classics. He's in Cat People, which we talked about in our spooky Halloween films episode. Right. Um, with Simone Simon. And I Walked with a Zombie with Francis D. and James Ellison, both considered sci-fi classics. Yes, now. yes. So, you know, and he was becoming a leading man, which was really great. He was in repeat performance, a really great role with one of my favorites, and it was a dear friend of mine, Joan Leslie. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, he just started doing some fun stuff. One of the reasons that Conway's career did not reach the level that Sanders did is because of uh, something that keeps <laughs> popping up in almost every episode we've done so far is an issue with alcohol. Yeah. It, isn't it amazing how much alcoholism plays a part in the demise of these great talents? Yes. But same with Conway. He was an alcoholic, had real issues with it. I think it stopped his career to some degree. It made him difficult to work with. He fell on hard times. I think in 1965, it was in the press that he was you know, discovered living in a $2 a day room in some flop house in Venice. So because people loved him and he had fans, people took up gifts and contributions and to try to to rehabilitate him. him. Yeah. And at one time, the great actor Lou Ayers even paid his rent. So he really fell on hard times, but people tried to help him, as did his brother, I think, to a degree. And he was dealing with his own struggles himself, George Sanders. So it was probably an interesting time for the two brothers having these demons that were so prevalent in their lives. Right. Sanders, he ended up moving to Spain and he ended up getting this devastating diagnosis of dementia. He became increasingly depressed and reclusive. He couldn't bear the idea of being in failing health and growing dependent on somebody. Mm. So sadly and tragically, he made the decision to kill himself. So um, in uh, 1972, he checked himself into a hotel in the coastal town near Barcelona, and he committed suicide with a drug overdose. And he left behind one of the most probably quoted suicide notes ever. And it just simply said, dear world, I am leaving because I am bored. I feel I have lived long enough. I am leaving you with your worries in this sweet cesspool. Good luck. Okay. Well, that wow. says a lot. Yeah. It, it's so interesting to me, the actors that we've talked about that really struggle with these demons. And it makes you wonder if those demons are part of what gives them the gift that they have. Yeah, the, the magic. The yeah. magic. And those same demons are what ultimately take them down. I think so. And I, I think those demons make you introspective. And I think to be a good actor, you have to have that introspection to bring out these characters. But it's, it's tragic. Both brothers died rather tragically because a few years prior, Conway had died with not a penny to his name. Really sad. Very sad. Well, this is this one's perkier. Yeah, okay, the, the good. next one. Let's yeah, move on we'll, to we'll, perky. I know we're we're down in the, the dumps not, here with these a little lift. alcoholic brothers. Let's go to the perky Lane sisters. Oh, we love the Lane sisters. <laughs> I love the Lane sisters. Although I do feel a little bad for Leota because oh, Leota she got, kind of got shafted. She really did get shafted, and I looked at. You know, <laughs> as much as I could of, of her background, I thought, why? Why? Why did Jack Warner not want her included in that film, Four Daughters? It just didn't seem fair. I know. It's funny because most people know the Lane sisters as being three. They think of them as being Rosemary, Priscilla, and Lola. There was actually a fourth, Leota. Leota. Who, for whatever reason, when they came to Hollywood and they were going to make this movie about these four sisters, Warner didn't like Leota and he canned her and replaced her with Gail Page, who, for the 
rest of her career, poor Gail Page became known as the fourth Lane sister. Lane sister. Now, I do wonder, and you've talked about this in the blog, when those four sisters got together, the real four, over Thanksgiving. Oh. I mean... Imagine that conversation. Yeah. That just doesn't seem fair. Poor Leota. Yeah, poor Leota. <laughs> now, their mother seemed to have some influence as well, in that she was a newspaper reporter. Yes. And she had some unfulfilled acting <laughs> aspirations. So perhaps she kind of shoved her daughters yes. into that arena. Yeah, one by one, their mother, Cora, who was basically a disappointed actress herself, saw herself to live vicariously through these four pretty talented girls. They could have been more all-American. Two of them were born in Indiana. Two were born in Iowa. Their father was a dentist. It was, it was an ideal upbringing. And so I think Cora knew she had hit the jackpot with these four girls. Yeah. So. Now they do end up going, at least Priscilla does, to the Fagan School of Dramatics. Yes. Which was quite an interesting place. That has a history of its own. Leota accompanied yeah. her, right? Yeah. Well, because Leota and the other sister, Lola, they they came to New York first. They got in shows. They started a Broadway career uh, to some modicum of success. But once Priscilla, who was the baby and probably the prettiest and probably the most talented, she came after high school, stayed with Leota. By now, Lola had shot off to Hollywood and was making movies. But Priscilla comes. She enrolls in this very well-known dramatic school. Leota pays for it, which was very lovely. Yes. And there is a, a great story about Priscilla. When she's at the Fagan Dramatic School, Priscilla is spotted by a talent agent who basically gets her screen test for MGM. And at the screen test, there's other actresses there also being screen test. And Priscilla wrote to her girlfriend back in Iowa about this experience. And she's talking about the other women that she's auditioning with. And she says, one was a strange looking girl with her hair slicked back in a sort of bun. Her name is said to be Katherine Hepburn. Not very pretty, I thought, but Mr. Altman said she was very talented. Margaret Sullivan, the Broadway actress, was also there. Interestingly, neither Lane nor Hepburn nor Sullivan were signed by MGM. Oh, boy. <laughs> what did MGM know? I know. So MGM missed out on three good ones. Yeah, they sure did. But shortly after that, Cora, their mother, ends up divorcing dentist daddy back in Iowa, and she hightails it to New York with Rosemary in tow. So now all the girls are out there Everybody's seeking... Everybody's auditioning. They're uh, seeking showbiz careers. And they all find it in their own way. But the beauty was they all ended up back in Hollywood when Warner Brothers put Priscilla and Rosemary under contract and they decide to make Four Daughters, which we talked about earlier, which ended up being a smash hit of a movie. It was very patriotic. It gave John Garfield one of his very first roles in a meaningful film. Mm -hmm. Poor Leota got the boot. Right. Dale Page is in. But it really started this whole series. They made Four Daughters, became Four Wives and became Four Mothers. And, you know, so they had a whole series of these movies. So the blockbuster was popular even back then of Absolutely. having a franchise of movies. But <laughs> one of the things that's interesting about Four Daughters is who directed it. Michael Curtiz directed it, who is oh. maybe one of the most famous directors Amazing director. of that era. Casablanca, White Christmas. We could go on and on. I want to talk about Lola for a minute because I think she got short changed because she really had a, a really nice career prior to coming together as the Lane sisters as an entity. She appeared with Betty Davis and Humphrey Bogart in Marked Woman. She was also, she took over the Torchy Blaine movie serial from Glenda Farrell, which was a very popular series in the late 30s. But one interesting thing was she was so popular at one point that comic book artist Jerry Siegel actually named the character of Lois Lane from Superman after Lola Lane. He took the name Lane from her. I love that impact she, she had. She lives on, yes. Yeah, and then she, she teamed up with her sisters. The rest is history. But definitely Priscilla left the biggest mark on Hollywood. She went on to do great movies. She ended up being in Saboteur, an Alfred Hitchcock movie, which is incredible, if nothing else, for the scene where... <laughs> Norman Lloyd. Lloyd is hanging from the Statue of Liberty at the very end. Right, who Norman Lloyd, who just died not too long yes. ago, actually attended an awards ceremony that I was at for Stage Raw, and oh, I got wow. to I have him on video. But I ran into him at a theater, a tiny little theater on Tahunga. Oh, wow. And he was sitting behind me. I was there by myself, and we struck up a conversation because I knew who he was. And I mentioned the Mercury Theater, which was founded by Orson 
Orson Welles and John Houseman, and Norman Lloyd was one of the original members. Yes, yes, yes started with and radio, yes. And Norman Lloyd really encouraged me, because I was an artistic director at a theater at the time, and encouraged me and said, you need to look up Eva Le Gallion, ah, who was the first female artistic director. That's right. And he could not have been kinder oh. and more lovely. And the fact that he's in this Hitchcock film as oh, well as you know, many other... I love that. I, yeah. I say it over and over again. We're so lucky we were here to know these people. Yes, yes. Well, back to Priscilla for a second. She really made some major movies at Warner Brothers. They teamed her up with James Cagney for The Roaring Twenties. She's in Dust Be My Destiny. She's in a great comedy that I love. It's very underrated and nobody knows it called Yes, My Darling Daughter. Mm which really has a fun feminist twist to it. If you get a chance to see it, check it out. But she really became a major star. But interestingly enough, we mentioned her being an Alfred Hitchcock saboteur. Hitchcock didn't want her. He absolutely was not having it with Priscilla Lane. He, she was, he really wanted Barbara Stanwyck and Gary Cooper, right? Yeah, he wanted his type of yeah. actors. And she was under contract, she and co-star Bob Cummings, and they were forced on him. And he did not like it one bit. And from what I hear, he made their lives a living hell while making the movie. But then after it was all was said and done, the movie turned out great. They both gave really good they performances. They gave very good performances. And even old Hitchcock finally came around and he said, you know, he was quoted as saying that he was lucky to have young players who were intelligent and sensitive to direction. Oh, because he was such a sensitive director. <laughs> I love, too, that she's in Arsenic and Old Lace with um, yes, Cary Grant. Yes, of course. Yeah. One of her most famous yes, movies, probably. Yes, she has that classic. Ingenue is probably a little too young of a, of a but leading leading lady yeah leading, leading, leading lady. lady it's funny because Priscilla ended up marrying a military guy you know he she was madly in love with and she ended up leaving her career to basically move from base camp to base camp to base camp to be with her man she got lured out of retirement twice the last time was for a really wonderful film noir called Bodyguard which mm. starred opposite Lawrence Tierney who, speaking of, <laughs> we really want to be able to talk about. But I think there are so many sibling rivalries that we haven't even gotten to mention. Maybe we should save Lawrence Tierney and his brother are for you, another day. Are you thinking a part two? <gasps> I'm thinking a part two. <laughs> let's do it. All right, let's do it. We have a lot more to share. I'm looking forward to part two. Me too. Now, it's time for the answer to this week's Hollywood Pop Quiz. <laughs> Steve. Yes, and the question was, which two famous sisters was George Sanders married to? Do you know, Nan? I know one of them. Well, then I know both, then right? Because they're both. sisters. I believe it was the Gabor sisters, correct? Ding, ding, ding. But which Yay! which two Gabors? Zsa Zsa. Yes. And I don't know who the other one was. <laughs> it was the, the unknown Gabor, Magda. Magda. Yes. But they George, all kind of looked alike. Like, they right? did. They looked yeah. just alike. But old George bagged him a couple of Gabors. <laughs> I th Talk about Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? How would that one be? Uh, yes, darling. Well, we look forward to bringing you part two of Sibling Rivalries. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. And we would love it if you would give us a follow on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions we'd love to hear from you please email us at info at from beneath the hollywood sign.com that's this week's view from beneath the hollywood sign you've been listening to from beneath the hollywood sign with steve cubine and ann mcnamara the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of tinseltown from its golden era join us next week for another episode and learn something else about hollywood you probably never knew take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review and tell your friends about us too it'll help grow the podcast visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schnebley. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit AirwaveMedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schnebley and Toth. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. That's a wrap. Thank you.